I know it's been a while, but um, I've taken care of what I needed to for my family. And so I'm back. Um, I promised you that I wanted to read to you about Joseph, um, the story of Asenath, right? And about bees and how this relates to prophecy and where we are right now. And so I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Um, and I will try to remember to put a link to this um, to to this document that I'm reading um, in the description so that you can access it yourself. And the first of the seven years of great plenty, Pharaoh sent forth Joseph to lay up corn and gather food within the cities. So Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt and came in the country of Heliopolis, where lived Potiphar, the priest and chief counselor of the great king. Now I'm going to go ahead and show you. So here's Heliopolis. Heliopolis was um, in Upper Egypt in the beginning of the Delta. So this is where um, the Great River, um, it um, fans out and makes its way into the sea. Here's a better um, image of it. So here's Heliopolis right here. See, this is the River Nile and see how it splits up, okay? in this Delta area. So it's right here at the beginning of the Delta. Heliopolis, or in the Egyptian, Iunu or Onu, is the pillar city. Now this is going to be interesting, okay? Or biblical, the city of On, or On. One of the most, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the most ancient Egyptian cities and the seat of worship of the sun god, Ra or Ray. It was the capital of the 15th gnome. So that would be like if you were in the United States, we would say the 15th state. Um, um, I think in um, the UK, they're districts. But anyway, it's the divisions of land, right? So, the, so the, you have the country of Egypt and it's the way it's divided up. Okay. In ancient time, it was the capital of the 15th gnome of lower Egypt, but Heliopolis was important as a religious rather than a political center. All right now we're going to kind of skip down. Um, this was really interesting. Little remains today of this great ancient Egyptian city. The sole surviving monument is the obelisk of Sesostris I, the oldest obelisk in existence. Of the pair of obelisks erected by um, Tutmos III in Heliopolis, now known as Cleopatra's Needles. Look at this, guys. One stands on the Thames Embankment in London. So this is the Great River Thames, the largest river that runs through um, the UK, and the other in Central Park in New York City. Now, I found that to be fascinating. So I went to look up about Cleopatra's needles that are in Central Park in New York City and on the Thames of London. Um, so let me just go there. Um, so this is London and here's Cleopatra's needle right here on the River Thames, which is a major river that goes, see it comes it goes through all of London. That's what I was trying to, to look at. I was looking to see where it originated. Um, but anyway, as you can see, it travels through all of London and then it looks like it, um, its outlet is into the sea here, into the channel, right? So here's something interesting though. Okay. So there's Buckingham Palace. Um, and then what I noticed that I thought was really interesting, let's see if I can find it again. is there's the needle and right here is Big Ben. Oh, that's really cool the way that popped up. Look at that. Wow, that's cool. We get to see. See a nice um, little video of Big Ben there in the heart of London. Now let's look and see where the sister obelisk is. It is right here in um, Central Park right there in Central Park. Um, 
in New York and something interesting is just just south of it, it looks like it's southwest, is Times Square. Okay, so there's the obelisk, there's Times Square. Look at this. So, um, where was the other one? Right here. There's the obelisk in London. There's Big Ben. Is that not interesting? How they're even positioned. See, this is northwest, right, of the obelisk. Both of them are on a major river. This one is the Thames River over here in um, New York. Notice that um, this is the um, East River. Okay. I just find that really interesting. And then the other reason why it's interesting, remember I told you that as I was looking into honey, um, Jacob Israel did a... Um, in his video, he talked about bees because there was a swarm of bees. Oh, that's in London. That's the wrong one. Let me go to the other one. Here it is. So there was a swarm of bees um, that, um, that swarmed in Times Square. In Times Square. And this happened just recently. What was the date of this? Let me find it. Okay, I found the date. It's June 12th, 2023. So very recently. Okay, so we have a swarm of bees in Times Square. Now, something else interesting, so that's 2023. There was also a swarm of bees in um, downtown London, which is where the other obelisk is. Um, and this one occurred, where was the date on this? Oh, the date's over here on the side. The 16th of May, 2014. So it was nine years ago. So why is this, why does this matter? Why do I care about these bees? All right, so we're going to finish the story of Asenath and Joseph in just a second. But something interesting, hang on, something buzzing. I'll tell you what, this has been an interesting video. I, I had to take an hour long absence a little while ago. I just had something buzzing. My husband's busy cutting his hair in the background. Oh my goodness. Okay, but getting back to the bees, okay? So it says here, um, so Samson, when he, there was a girl that he was wanting to marry. And um, when he went down to where she lived to check her out, um, there was a lion and he tore the lion apart with his bare hands, I think is what the story says. And then he came back later for the betrothal um, and the carcass of the lion was there. And inside the carcass of the lion, there was honeycomb. And it talks about how he took some of the honeycomb and gave it to his parents to eat, but didn't tell them where it had come from. But anyway, he came up with this um, um, question to ask, okay, and the answer to the question um, that he asked these um, young men, um, the answer to the riddle was about the lion and the um, honey, and this is the answer. So I'm in Judges 14, verse 14. Isn't that interesting? 14, 14. So he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat. And out of the strong came something sweet. Now, this is jumping into my mind right now, but notice this is 1414. Okay, we have seven years of famine and seven years of, well, starts with seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine, 14, right? And um, we're about to tie this to the story of Joseph and Asenath, right? Which um, at the beginning of the story of Joseph and Asenath, we are um, in the time of the seven years of plenty. And the first swarm that I told you about um, was the one that was in London, and that was 2014. So, And the other thing interesting about that is 2014 is the time of the first tetrad of blood moons that were, that were found, right? Um, so was that during the seven good years? I don't know, but I just, wow, just lots of interesting things popping up all at once. 
Um, I just thought I would also share this information about the obelisk that was erected in London. On the 12th of September, 1878, Cleopatra's Needle was erected on the Victoria Embankment of the River Thames 59 years after the UK was given it as a gift. The bronze sphinxes guarding the obelisk were designed by George John Vulliamy and created at the Ecclestone Ironworks in Pem Pemlico in 1881. They include the words, so on these bronze sphinxes that are overlooking this obelisk in London, you have the words, the good God, Tutmosis III, given life. Interesting, huh? Okay, I don't know exactly where we left off, but I'm going to continue here. His daughter, talking about Potiphera, the priest of Egypt, um, his daughter Asenath was the fairest of all the virgins of the earth and seemed rather to be a daughter of Israel than an Egyptian. And that's going to get um, revealed um, further on in the story. But Asenath was scornful and proud. Oh, the pride of the drunkards of Ephraim. Okay, Isaiah 28. And a despiser of men. No man of all the sons of men had seen her with his eyes, for she lodged within a strong tower, tall and wide, near by the habitation of Potiphera, the priest. Now high upon this tower were ten chambers. The first chamber was fair and great, and was builded of marble blocks of diverse colors. The walls were of precious stones set in a chasing of gold, and the ceiling thereof was golden. There stood the gods of the Egyptians in metal of silver and gold, and Asenath bowed before them and offered sacrifice every day of all the days. The second chamber was the habitation of Asenath, and was adorned cunningly with ornaments of gold and silver, with costly gems, and with auras and stuffs most precious. In the third chamber was brought together the wealth of all the world, and in that place also were set the Umbries of Asenath. So I looked up the word Umbries, because that's not a word I was familiar with. Um, and here it is. So this is the, okay, so this is the word I looked up, A-U-M-B-R-Y, just like it said, but the English spelling of it is A-M-B-R-Y, okay? So it is a recessed cupboard in the wall of a church near the altar used to store sacred vessels. A recessed cupboard in the wall of a church near the altar used to store sacred vessels. So let's go back and continue reading. So let's see. Um, we were on the third chamber. Okay. In the third chamber was brought together the wealth of all the world, and in that place also were set the Ombres of Asenath. Seven virgin, virgins, her fellows, lodged in the seven other chambers. They were very fair, and no man had spoken with them, nor any male child. Isn't that interesting that it's seven virgins? That makes me think of the seven churches. Okay. Um, okay. And Asenath at this point is obviously bowing to false gods daily um, and is obsessed with riches. The chamber of Asenath was pierced with three windows. The first, which was very wide, looked toward the east. And isn't that interesting because in the scriptures it tells us, well, actually, I'll just, I'll just pull it up. Isaiah 2, 6, therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. The second looked towards the south and the third was set towards the north. Here was spread a couch of gold covered with a purple coverlet, embroidered with golden thread, and hemmed with jacinths. There slept Asenath with no bedfellow, neither had man sat ever upon her bed. About this house was a godly garden, 
I'm sorry, it was a goodly garden, closed round with a very strong wall and entered by four iron gates. Each door had for warders eighteen men, very mighty and young, well armed and full of valor. At the right side of the garden sprang a fountain of living water. That's kind of interesting, right? At the right side of the garden sprang a fountain of living water. And near by the fountain a cistern, which gave of this water to all the trees of the garden. And these trees bore much fruit. And Asenath was queenly as Sarah, gracious as Rebekah, and fair as Rachel. I couldn't help but notice the connection to Revelation 22. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, living water, clear as crystal proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits. Look at this. Each tree yielding its fruit every month. So there sprang up a fountain of living water, and nearby the fountain a cistern, which gave of this water to all the trees of the garden, and these trees bore much fruit. And Asenath was queenly as Sarah, gracious as Rebekah, and fair as Rachel. There's something also about the cistern. I'm going to share a couple of scriptures real quick with you about cisterns. Okay, first of all, I have Jeremiah chapter 2. I'm going to start in verse 11. Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods? Remember, she's bowing to these false gods every day. For what does not profit? Be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be very desolate. Remember, desolation is what is going to come upon um, the daughter of Zion. Okay, or Ephraim. It talks about the desolating sickness in um, Isaiah 28. All right. Be very desolate, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, right? Because in the garden there was the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So this is in Numbers 21, and I just want to make a point about the song that was sung because I think it's prophetic. Um, starting in verse 16, from there they went to Be'er, the well where, the, where Yahweh said to Moses, gather the people so that I may give them water. Then Israel sang this song, spring up, O well. All of you sing to it. The princes dug the well. The nobles of the people hollowed it out. So hollowed it out like creating cisterns, right, that hold the water, right, that's springing up. Anyway, the nobles of the people hollowed it out with their scepters and with their staffs. Now, I want to do a study with you guys about this word staffs um, and rod, because I think that's important for our time, but I can't do it right now because I'll send us too far off track here. Um, but anyway, so I, I think that this is... Um, like a prophetic song about the time that um, the story of Joseph and Asenath is talking about. And Asenath was queenly as Sarah, gracious as Rebekah, and fair as Rachel. Joseph sent a message to Potiphar that he would come to his house. So Potiphar rejoiced greatly, saying to his daughter, Joseph, the friend of God, enters herein. I would give thee to him as his wife. But Asenath was sore vexed when she heard these words and said, No captive shall ever be my husband, but only the son of a king. Whilst they spake thus together, a messenger came before them and cried, Joseph is here. So Asenath fled to her chamber high within the tower. Now Joseph was seated in Pharaoh's own chariot of beaten gold, and it was drawn by four horses white as snow, with bridles and harnesses of gold. Joseph was clad in a vesture of fine linen, white and glistening, and his mantle was of purple, spun with gold. He wore a golden circlet upon his head, and in his crown were set twelve stones, most precious each stone, having for or ornament a golden star. Now, I think that Joseph in this story is a picture of the groom coming for his bride, right? Of the Mashiach, of, of, of the Savior. Moreover, he held in his hand the royal scepter 
and an olive branch charged with fruit. Potipharah and his wife hastened to meet him and bowed before him to the ground. They led him within the garden and caused the doors to be shut. But when Asenath regarded Joseph from on high, and look at that, they brought him into the garden and shut the door, right? But when Asenath regarded Joseph from on high, the tower, she repented of the words she spoke concerning him and said, Behold the sun and the chariot of the sun. Certainly this Joseph is the child of God. For what father could beget so fair an offspring, and what womb of woman could carry such, such light? Joseph entered in the house of Potiphar, and whilst they washed his feet, he asked what woman had looked forth from the window of the tower. Let her go forth from the house, he commanded. Oops. This he said, let me go back up a page, because he feared lest she should desire him and should send him messages and diverse gifts, even as other women of her nation, whom he had refused with holy indignation. But Potiphar replied, Sire, this is my daughter, who is a virgin, and hateth men. Neither hath she seen any man save me, her father, and thyself this very day. If thou wilt, she shall come before thee and salute thee. Then Joseph thought within himself, Since she hates man, she will not cast her eyes upon me. So he answered to her father, Since your daughter is a virgin, I will cherish her even as my sister. Then her mother went out to seek Asenath, and brought her before Joseph. Salute thy brother, said Potiphar, who hateth the strange woman, even as thou hatest man. God keep thee, replied Asenath, for thou art blessed of God Most High. And Joseph answered, May the God of life bless thee evermore. Then commanded Potiphar that she should kiss Joseph, but as she drew near, Joseph set his hand against her breast and said, It is not meet that a man who worships the living God and eats the bread of life and drinks from the chalice without corruption should embrace this strange woman who bows down before deaf and dumb idols, who serves them with the kisses of her mouth is anointed with their reprobate oil and eats an accursed bread and drinks unsanctified wine from their table. When Asenath heard Joseph speak these words, she was sore vexed, even unto tears. Wherefore, Joseph took pity upon her and blessed her, laying his hand upon her head. Asenath rejoiced greatly at the benediction. She sought her bed, sick, with fear and joy, and renounced the gods before whom she bowed, and humbled herself to the ground. So Joseph ate and drank, and when he rose to go, Potiphar prayed him to tarry till the morrow, but he might not, and parted, having promised to return within eight days. Now notice that he's returning within eight days. The eighth day is the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. I do believe that that is a um, that, that that is a, a correlation. Also, earlier um, when he said when he refused Asenath because of her filth, um, I believe that that is um, a type and shadow of um, Jesus Christ refusing both the northern and southern kingdoms because of their filth, right? They were unworthy and, and they were left um, grieving among themselves, right? But the interesting thing is they still had a blessing upon them because God had made promises to Abraham concerning his seed. And um, so they would be brought back at some point after they fully repented. So anyway, um, yeah, I find this story to be really fascinating. Um, then Asenath put on sad raiment, such as she wore at the death of her brother, and went clothed in a garment of heaviness. She closed the doors of her chamber upon her and wept. Moreover, she flung forth 
all her idols by the window set towards the north. All the royal meat she gave to the dogs. She put dust upon her head, lay upon the ground, and lamented bitterly for seven days. But the eighth morning, at the hour when the cock crows and the dogs howl at the breaking of the day, Asenath looked forth from the window giving to the east and saw a star shining clear and the heavens open and there appeared a great light. So she just saw a great light out of the east window and it made me think of Matthew 24, 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. So after seeing the great light from the east window, she fell to earth with her face in the dust, and a man descended from the heavens and stood by her head, calling on her by name. But Asenath answered nothing because of the greatness of her fear. Then the man called her a second time, saying, Asenath, Asenath, and she replied, Lord, here am I. Tell me whom thou art. And he said, I am prince of the house of God and captain of his host. Rise, stand upon thy feet, for I have to speak with thee. Hmm. Captain of his host. So is that Michael, the archangel? Then Asenath raised her head and saw a man by her side who is in all who in all points was, as it were, Joseph. He was clad in a white stole and bore the royal scepter in his hand, and a crown was upon his brow. His face was as the lightning, his eyes as rays of the sun, and the hair of his head like a flame of fire. No, that is Jesus Christ. Those are descriptors that are used throughout um, the book of Revelation and other places in the New Testament to describe Christ, his eyes like rays of the sun, his face like lightning, that's going to be Jesus Christ. That's going to be Yahushua HaMashiach. At the sight of him, Asenath was sore afraid and hid her face upon the ground. But the angel raised her to her feet and comforted her, saying, Put off this black raiment with which thou art clothed, and this girdle of sadness. Remove the sackcloth from thy body. And the dust from thine head, right? Because he's going to wipe away all of our tears. Cleanse thy face and thy hands with living water. Right? Jesus is the living water. The Mashiach is the living water. And adorn thee with fair apparel, for I have somewhat to say to thee. So she adorned herself with speed. And when she came to him again, he said, Asenath. Take off this ornament from thine head, for thou art virgin. Rejoice and be of good cheer, for thy name is written in the book of life. Right? And doesn't it say he's coming for all of those whose names are written in the book of life? And shall never be taken away. Thou art born again this very day. Nicodemus, how can we born, be born again? Can we climb back in our mother's womb? And quickened anew. There's the baptism of fire and the Holy Ghost to be quickened anew. For thou shalt receive the bread of blessing and drink of the wine without corruption. Okay, they're drunk right on wine because the wine is corrupted. It's not the pure doctrine of Christ anymore, right? Um, and be anointed with the holy chrism. Now that's an interesting word. I don't even know what chrism is. Hang on. It's so interesting how translations are affected by our um, by our um, culture that we're coming out of, right? So chrism, a consecrated mixture of oil and balsam used for anointing in church sacraments such as baptism and confirmation. Yea, I have given thee for wife to Joseph, and thou no more shall be called Asenath, 
but a name shall be given thee a fair refuge. So she's called fair refuge and she's given as a wife to Joseph. Now I find this very interesting because, you know, I've shared over and over that um, it is the house of Joseph that is supposed to create those five cities um, in what is being called modern Egypt. And those cities are cities of refuge. And um, all of um, Israel is going to be gathered to those cities before the old Jerusalem then will be redeemed. First, the gathering will happen among those cities, just like Joseph of old, who went into captivity in Egypt, then rose to be second only to the Pharaoh um, and created the city of refuge, Goshen, which then saved his, um, his family that came to him from um, the famines that were going on in the land in that day. The same thing is going to happen again, I do believe. Um, but a name shall be given thee of fair refuge. And you see, it is, it is Asenath, the bride, that made herself ready. Right? Who was able to get that name, fair refuge. Um, I don't know how much of this has come to us um, in completion, but there is too much here that um, ties in to the scriptures for this not to have originally been something that, um, that, that came to us um, as scripture. I don't know how much of it has been retained and how much of it has been corrupted, but um, I do believe that this was originally scripture because there's just too much here. Um, to have just been created. For thy penitence hath come before the high king, of whom she is the daughter, and thou shalt ever live before him in mirth and gladness. And of course, the high king is our father in heaven, correct? And because she's written in the book of life, she's considered a daughter of the Most High. And thou shalt ever live before him in mirth and gladness. Then inquired she of the angel his name, but he answered, My name is written by the finger of God in the book of the Most High King. Ah, oh, <laughs> that reminds me of um, the tablets that were written by the finger of God for Moses, for Moshe. And, and it's interesting because... Um, you know, that's when we were given the name of God as Yahweh, right? Through Moshe. Anyway, but all that is written therein may not be told, neither is it proper for the hearing of mortal man. But Asenath caught the angel by his mantle and said, If I have found favor in thine eyes, sit for a little space upon this bed, where never a man has sat and I will spread the table before my, my Lord. And the angel replied, do quickly. So Asenath set a fair linen cloth upon the table and put thereon new bread of a sweet savor. Then said the angel, give me also a little honey in the honeycomb. See, this is where the honey comes in, okay? So first, Asenath has been forgiven and redeemed and been given the name of City of Refuge. And then she's given um, Honeycomb. We're, we're going to get to that, okay? And um, then I'm going to share a couple of scriptures with you about what honey is in the scriptures. So Asenath was grievously troubled because she had no honey to set before her guest, okay? Um, you know what? This is the perfect moment to tell you what honey is. And it might be overkill, but I'm actually going to read this whole chapter because it sets this up so beautifully. I do believe that this chapter of Proverbs is prophetic. 
um, and it's speaking of the moment in which we are about to enter. Do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them, which of course reminds me of Psalm 1, right? Um, blessed is the man whose um, love is the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Hang on a second, I'll pull it up. So this is what it reminded me of, Psalms 1. Blessed is the man who walks not, see, I knew I was skipping what I wanted to say, who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Okay, and he'll be a tree, right, planted by rivers of water. Um, so going back to where we just were in Proverbs, do not be envious of evil men nor desire to be with them. Okay. Do not, they don't sit in the seat of the scornful. Okay. Um, nor walk in the path of the unrighteous. For their heart devises violence and their lips talk of troublemaking. Through wisdom, a house is built. Look, this is important. Remember this word wisdom. Okay. And it is the house of God that we are looking to build zion the new jerusalem the house of god it is through wisdom that a house is built and by understanding it is established okay by knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches a wise man is strong yes a man of knowledge increases strength for by wise counsel you will wage your own war Okay, this is going to be a war of words, guys. And in a multitude of counselors, there is safety. Wisdom is too lofty for a fool. He does not open his mouth in the gate. He who plots to do evil will be called a schemer. The devising of foolishness is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to men. Okay, and what did we just see here? Um nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Some translations say, um, in the seat of the scoffer. Okay, I just want to point these things out to you so you can see the correlations between these things. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. What is this day of adversity? This is the time of Jacob's trouble. These are the times in which we find ourselves. Deliver those who are drawn toward death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Um, that is the next study we're going to do. Because it's speaking prophetically to us right now. Deliver those who are drawn toward death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. Jeremiah. Jeremiah says of the daughter of Zion he, that she is fainting before the murderers. If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? Here we are. My son, eat honey because it is good, and the honeycomb, which is sweet to your taste. So shall, so we're about to find out what honey is, so shall the knowledge of wisdom be to your soul. If you have found it, there is a prospect, and your hope will not be cut off. Okay, let's look at what the other translation of prospect is. Latter end. Okay, the latter days, the last days. If you have found it, there is a latter end. There is there is a a hope, right? There is a better future. Okay, my son, eat honey because it is good and the honeycomb which is sweet to your taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be to your soul. If you have found it, there is a latter end and your hope will not be cut off. Do not lie in wait, a wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not plunder his resting place, for a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again. Right? This is the time of Jacob's trouble. 
okay? We may fall seven times, but we're going to rise again. We're going to rise in Christ, in, in the Mashiach. But the wicked shall fall by calamity. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, okay? We are not to rejoice in the fall of those who are wicked. We are to pray for them. And do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Lest the Lord see it, lest Yahweh see it, and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the wicked. For there will be no prospect for the evil man. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. My son, fear Yahweh and the king. Do not associate with those given to change. Okay. What is one of the political mantras that we've heard over and over and over? Change, right? For their calamity will rise suddenly. And who knows the ruin those two can bring. So going back up here, let's just look at it one more time. My son, eat honey because it is good in the honeycomb, which is sweet to your taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be to your soul. If you have found it, there is a latter end. Coming back up here, it says, Through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So, when it was time, when Asenath was given the new name, um, which is, let me just go up, I'm going to get lost, aren't I? When she was given the new name, which is up here even further. Hang on, I'll pause while I find it. Okay, so she was given, but a name shall be given thee, a fair refuge. So right after she's given this name, a fair refuge, then comes this um, moment when she says, Sire, I had no honey, but thou speakest the word and it is there. Okay, let me go back up. I went too far. So he, so the angel says to her, give me also a little honey in the honey comb. So Asenath was grievously troubled because she had no honey to set before her guest. Okay, because we have no wisdom yet, because we have been in this world where everything that is good is called evil and everything that is evil is called good, right? We, we, there's just no wisdom. Um, but um, he says, look within thine ombre. Now remember what an ombre is. This is fascinating. A recessed cupboard in the wall of a church near the altar used to store sacred vessels. And it's interesting to me because there is a scripture in Isaiah that says, Be ye clean that carry the vessels of Yahweh. Be ye clean that carry the vessels of Yahweh. Okay. And, and this is a place to store sacred vessels. So you have to look in within the sacred vessels, okay, the sacred storage places, and that is where you're going to find it. So let's let's go ahead and keep going. This is this is really fascinating. Look within thine ombre, and thou shalt find withal to furnish thy table. Then she hastened thereto and found a store of virgin honey white as snow, of sweetest savor. So she spake to the angel, Sire, I had no honey, but thou spakest the word, and it is there, and the perfume thereof is as the breath of thy mouth. Okay? Because he breathed into the man the breath of life. This is taking us back to the Adam before he was corrupted. The angel smiled at the understanding of Asenath and placed his hand upon her head and said, Blessed be thou, O Asenath, because thou hast forsaken thy idols 
and believed in our living Yahweh. Yea, blessed are they whom penitence brings before him. And they shall eat of this honey gathered by the bees of paradise from the dew of the roses of heaven. And those who eat thereof shall never see death, but shall live forevermore. Okay, I want to share a prophecy that's in Isaiah chapter 7 that I've been pondering for a long time. So, um, starting in verse 18, And it shall come to pass in that day that Yahweh will whistle for the fly that is in the farthest part of the rivers of Egypt. Now remember, this place called Egypt in the latter days is where Ephraim is going to be. It's where the five cities are going to be established. It's where the place of refuge is, um, which I believe Asenath, um, in the story we were just reading, is a type and shadow of. So he's going to call for these flies. But listen to this. And for the bee that is in the land of Assyria, they will come and all of them will rest in the desolate valleys and in the clefts of the rocks and on all thorns and in all pastures. So this is that great gathering that we were talking about to a land that had become desolate, right? That's Isaiah 28 that talks about the desolating scourge that's going to come upon the drunkards of Ephraim, right? So after the land is made desolate, then this great, um, this great gathering is going to happen. In that same day, Yahweh will shave with a hired razor with those from beyond the river with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs, and will also remove the beard. So this, I believe, is that same story. So, at the t so Babylon is going to fall and... Um, the New Jerusalem is going to rise simultaneously. It's going to happen at the same time. That's that's what's so amazing about it, is that um, we it'll seem like nothing but destruction, but then all of a sudden we'll realize that out of that destruction has come the city of our God, right? Um, so shaving the head and the hair of the legs, um, and removing the beard, that is what you did. Egypt, Egypt did to their slaves. Whenever they bought slaves, they shaved them completely. Um, and so that's a sign of slavery. So the king of Assyria <coughs> will be enslaving the people. It says in the same day, right? That, um, that um, God, that Yahweh, will be delivering his people. It shall be in that day, so this is really interesting, that a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep. So these are three different groups of people. And remember that in Isaiah 19, it also talks about the three groups of people that come together. I'll just read that to you really quickly. Oh, I am in Isaiah, so I need to go to 19. And it's at the bottom. So it says, in that day, there's that same phrase that we just read. Israel, that's one, will be one of three. It tells us three, three groups brought together with Egypt and Assyria. A blessing in the midst of the land, whom Yahweh Sabaoth shall bless, saying, Blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. So there you are, three groups <coughs> of people, excuse me. And here you have three again, a young cow and two sheep. I don't think that's a coincidence. So it shall be, and notice the cow, right? Egypt, my people, because the cow is the symbol of Egypt. Okay. So it shall be from the abundance of milk they give that he will eat curds. For curds and honey everyone will eat who is left in the land. They will all have this incredible wisdom, right? This knowledge of God. 
just like it says in Jeremiah, sorry, that's taking me to Jeremiah, you, you know me. <laughs> There's, I just, I can't help myself. So let me just duplicate this um, and we'll find out what that wisdom is. Okay, because they're going to eat curds or milk. Milk is the basic message of the gospel. Okay, the message of salvation that we are supposed to be publishing, right, all over. Um, and then, here it is, then the um, honey is uh, the knowledge of God. Okay, behold, the days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says Yahweh. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahweh. Notice here, it just breaks it all down to house of Israel, even though up here it says house of Israel and the house of Judah, because he is one shepherd and he has one fold. So once this covenant is made, everyone is Israel. Everyone's of the same fold, right? Um, it says, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Okay. This is wisdom to know the one true God, right? And Yahushua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. And I will be their God and they will be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, No, Yahweh, for they all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them, says Yahweh, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Okay, so let's go back to the story of Asenath. I know I sometimes I take pretty long um, uh, detours, but um, I'm hoping that it is helping me and others to have faith in the process, to see what our God is doing, and um, to have faith that he's going to bring all of this about for our good, because we love him, right? Um, it says, look within thine ombre. I'm just going to reread this part, because it's almost over. And thou shalt find withal to furnish thy table. Then she hastened there too, right? Look within your inner vessels. And found a store of virgin honey, white as snow, of sweetest savor. So she spake to the angel, Sire, I had no honey, but thou spakest the word, and here it is. And the perfume thereof is as the breath of thy mouth. The angel smiled at the understanding of Asenath. Right? She now has wisdom. And placed his hand upon her head and said, Blessed be thou, O Asenath, because thou hast forsaken thy idols and believed in our living God and our living Yahweh. Yea, blessed are they whom penitence bringeth before him. For they shall eat of this honey gathered by the bees of paradise. And he will call whistle for the bees of Assyria. Right? We just read that from the dew of the roses of heaven and those who eat thereof shall never see death, but shall live forevermore. Then the angel stretched forth his hand and took of the honeycomb and break it. And he ate a little and gave the rest to the mouth of Asenath saying, this day hast thou eaten of the bread of life and art anointed with the holy chrism. And remember, we looked and um, chrism was vessels, right? Uh, no, excuse me, it wasn't vessels. It was a holy oil, right? Okay, let's just look again. Okay, a consecrated mixture of oil and balsam used for anointing in church sacraments. Okay, so and are anointed with the holy oil. Beauty is given thee for ashes, for virtue shall never go from thee, right? Um, that the Gentiles won't enter into the city, right, anymore. Neither shall thy youth wither, 
nor thy fairness fail, but thou shalt be as the strong city. See, there it is, the strong city. Builded as a refuge for the children of our Yahweh, who is king forevermore. Wow. So there it is. She's being compared to this strong city, right? The city of refuge, the new Jerusalem. Then the angel touched the honeycomb and it became unbroken as before. That is beautiful. Again, he stretched forth his hand and with his finger signed the cross thereon. And there where his finger touched came forth blood. So he spake to Asenath and said, Behold this honey. While she gazed thereon, she saw bees come forth from that honey, some white as snow, others were male as um, Jason's. And they gathered about her and set virgin honey in the palm of her hand, and she ate thereof, and the angel with her. Bees, said the angel, return now to your own place. Okay, so he's going to call for the bees, right, um, from Assyria. Wow. So they passed through that window, which gave upon the east, and took their way to paradise. Faithful as these bees are, the words which I have spoken. Faithful as these bees are, the words which I have spoken. Then the angel put forth his hand three times and touched the honey, and fire came forth and consumed the honey without singeing the table, and the perfume which came from the honey and the fire was very sweet. Of the blessing of the seven maidens and of the marriage of Asenath as set forth in the story. Okay, so there were seven virgins who served Asenath. Okay, are these the seven churches? I don't know, but I find this fascinating, right? Yahweh, I have, Asenath said to the angel, Yahweh, I have with me seven virgins born in one night and nourished with me from my childhood until now. I will seek them and thou shalt bless them even as thou hast blessed me. So she brought them before him, okay, the gathering of Israel, right? And he blessed them, saying, May the Most High God bless you and make you to be seven strong columns of the city of refuge. Okay, well, actually, I was thinking about the gathering of Israel, which I guess it is because remember, everyone is Israel once they enter into this covenant because there's only one sheep and one sheepfold, right? But now this is making me think, of that verse in Isaiah 49. I'll read it to you. Isaiah 49 and 5. And now Yahweh says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to what? To bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him. To bring Jacob back to him. And if we go back a chapter uh, let's see if I remember this right. Oh, that's not a chapter. That's a verse. Okay. Oh, no, that's Isaiah 1. Okay, hang on. I'll pull it up. So it's Jacob that has to be brought back by the servant, right? Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel and have come forth from the waters of Judah, which is baptism who swear by the name of Yahweh and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth or in righteousness. For they call themselves after the holy city, right? After Zion. And lean on the God of Israel. Yahweh Sabaot is his name. Okay? So, these are those who have come out of the waters of Judah. They are baptized. These are Christians. Okay? So, the Christians have to be brought back. Right? So that... Israel can be gathered. And why do I say that? Because um, the Christians are the seven churches. Every one of the Christians are in one of the seven churches. They're numbered there, right? Um, 
And so Asenath's job, what she did was she, once she was um, purified and entered into the covenant in its fullness um, and received of that honey, the first thing she did was to go and get her the seven virgins who have served with her, who have served her all of their lives, right? And brought them in to be blessed. I hope you guys are seeing this connection. I just find this fascinating. So she brought them, the seven virgins, um, before him, and he blessed them, saying, May the Most High God bless you and make you to be seven strong columns of the city of refuge. Okay. Afterwards, and that makes so much sense to me because then it's their job to go out and gather Israel from the four corners of the earth, everywhere that they've been scattered. Afterwards, he bade Asenath to carry forth the table, and while she went about her task, the angel vanished from her eyes. But looking towards the east, she saw, as it were, a chariot drawn by four horses, ascending towards heaven. So Asenath prayed to God right humbly that he would pardon the boldness with which she had spoken to the captain of his host. While she prayed thus, a messenger came to Potiphar, saying that Joseph, the friend of God, sought this house and was even then at his door. Asenath hastened to meet him and awaited his coming before the offices of the house. When Joseph entered the garden, she bowed herself before him and washed the dust from his feet, telling him the words which the angel had spoken concerning her. The next day Joseph prayed Pharaoh that he might have Asenath to wife, and Pharaoh gave him the woman. He set also garlands of gold upon their heads, the fairest that cunning smiths could fashion, and caused them to embrace in the fair I'm sorry, in the sight of men. So for seven days was kept high feast and festival, nor might any man labor for those days. He also gave them new names, calling Joseph the son of God and Asenath, daughter of the Most High King. Before the time of the seven lean years, Asenath bore two sons, and Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, which is to say forgetfulness, for, said he, God hath made me to forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second was called Ephraim, which is to say fruitfulness, for, said he, God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So that's the end of this version of it. Um, there are multiple versions of this. Um, it is part of the um, Pseudepigrapha. In one of the versions in particular, it is revealed that Asenath was actually the daughter of Dinah, that she was a Hebrew and she didn't even know it, um, which is kind of like Ephraim, right? Um, and the northern tribes who have completely lost their identity. They don't know who they are, right? But um, the Most High God knows who they are. So to finish up, going back to the story that we read about Samson, who found the honeycomb um, inside of the carcass of the lion. Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. Okay, So um, Babylon is represented as a winged lion. Okay, here's some um, different representations of that. Okay, so here's the winged lion with a human's head. Here's a lion from the gate of Babylon. This is an actual um, lion. So the winged lion, and you can see, I think you can see right here his wings. Anyway, yeah, there's his wing. It goes all the way across here. Anyway, um, the winged lion is um, a representation of, as I said, Babylon. So from the carcass of the lion, from the death of Babylon, right, comes the honey, comes um, wisdom from the death of Babylon. Then the wisdom can rise, right? Um, 
And to end, I just want to remind us that at the beginning of the story of Asenath, we found out that she um, lived in the city of On, um, um, or also called Heliopolis, which was the religious center um, for the worship of the sun god um, there in Egypt. And I wanted to um, remind us about the obelisks that were taken from there. Okay, these Egyptian obelisks were taken from that city. Um, interestingly enough, where Asenath was, right? And they were taken specifically to New York City and to London. And I wanted to point out the fact, since we were talking about um, the lion being the um, being the symbol of Babylon, I wanted, and remember in the carcass of the lion, after the lion was destroyed, was found the honeycomb, right? Um, I wanted to um, show you this photo. Um, these are, this is the obelisk um, called Cleopatra's Needle. So it's a pair, right? One's in New York City and one's here in London. This is the one in London. And looking upon it, watching over it, are two lions after uh, the manner of the Sphinx in Egypt. I just find this fascinating. I, I don't think this is all a coincidence. Thank you for sharing the study with me.